All, all right, people, we're on to decision trees. Now, decision trees is the second machine learning algorithm we're going to implement, and we're going to do it in a little bit more sophisticated way than we did with logistic regression, and that we're going to take it several steps further um, towards the way people might use it in practice, as far as to using it as the basis for ensembles, which we'll get to in a few lectures, weeks, I don't know, I uh, who can keep track of time. The other thing about decision trees is that um, it is the learning algorithm that I did my research on. Well, I mean, I looked at a bunch of different learning algorithms, but this is the one that I happened to write a paper that people used more than seven seconds after I was done with it. So you could look that up if you want. It's a fancy version of a decision tree that works on data streams instead of working on a data set. I'm not going to talk about that anymore in this class. Moving on. So what is a decision tree? A decision tree is a model for classification, regression, and probability estimation. It can do all of those things, and we'll see in the course of this lecture how it goes about those. Um, CART was maybe one of the first versions of the algorithm. Another popular version of the algorithm is called C4.5, or that was a that's an implementation that you'll see in a lot of research papers at a very at a particular point in time as something that everybody used and everybody compared to and everybody extended. Um, decision trees are good when, you know, here's some properties of when you might want to use a decision tree. The problem has complex interactions between the variables because in a decision tree, the way the tree interprets one variable can be different depending on the value of another variable. It can be completely different. Whereas in our previous one in logistic regression, it was just a linear combination across the variables. So these complex interactions didn't exist. Um, but uh, decision trees sort of require that there aren't too many relevant features. With um, logistic regression, I see people doing hundreds of thousands. With decision trees, you probably want to have far, far fewer input features than you would with logistic regression. Um, thousands does even sound a little bit like a lot, although, you know, to every rule there are exceptions, but that's kind of if you're, as you're coming to this at the beginning, just something to file away. If you have hundreds of thousands of features, maybe don't use decision trees. Um, and then they're a little good. You can somewhat interpret what the decision tree is telling you um, a little bit more naturally than you can with logistic regression. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, but there are there is some advantage to just being able to visualize the first few decisions that the decision tree makes. Um, that'll get you some intuition about what's going on. But decision trees aren't really used in practice. Um, I, you know, like I said, my, some of my uh, early papers were about decision trees, and I don't think, I mean, yeah, maybe one, nah, I never used a simple decision tree. We tried to several times, and every single time we kind of like backed down, and I was like, eh, that's not really worth it. Let's go back to, you know, one of the competitors was logistic regression, and the other time the competitor was an ensemble. So the, the simple decision tree on its own never was something that we ended up shipping in practice. For me, I mean, other people certainly have used it in practice. Um, and yeah, most real world applications will use ensembles today, or, you know, nowadays, not today, but nowadays, be ensembles or pushing towards trying to get into neural networks is what people would generally do. But despite all that, decision trees is a very popular Machine learning method that's been around for a heck of a long time has had a series of great algorithms for it. It's still competitive in certain applications when you push it all the way into the ensemble space. And so it's an important thing for you to learn a lot about in a first machine learning course. So reminder that we're going to go through these three components of a learning algorithm, the model structure, the loss function, and the optimization that the algorithm uses to learn the model structure. And like last time I made a joke with the uh, logistic regression, it was linear models with sigmoid activation, log loss, gradient descent, go. This time it is a tree, entropy gain, greedy, single step, search. There you go. You know what you need, go. All right, let's get into it. Structure of a decision tree. Here's an example. Um, with a decision tree, you interpret it as in order to classify a new sample, you essentially drop the sample in at the top of the tree. And then the internal nodes of the tree contain tests on the features of that sample. Um, so in this particular case, it's about like, should we play Frisbee or something like that? I think this, this example is from the book. And so you'd say, um, this is the properties of the weather today, um, what it's like. 
And the prediction that this tree is trying to make is, should we play Frisbee? So you'd say if the outlook for the weather today is that it's going to be sunny, overcast, or rain. So if the outlook is for rain, uh, you would go down this branch out of this test, and you would say, yes, we're playing Frisbee today. If, on the other hand, the outlook was for rain, um, there's more decisioning to do. You Just because it's raining doesn't mean you're not going to play Frisbee. But if it's raining a little bit and there's a little bit of wind, okay, sure, we can play Frisbee in the rain. But if there's strong wind, nah, we'll stay home. You can't throw a Frisbee with a strong wind. It's just not worth it um, when it's rainy and windy. Otherwise, if it's sunny, you might want to go and play Frisbee. So you've, you've tested the outlook. The outlook comes back as sunny. So you go down this branch out of that first node of your decision tree. You take the sunny branch and you come to a second internal node, which contains another decision. And it says, well, if it's sunny, is it humid? And if it's really humid, you're not going to want to run around and throw a Frisbee. So, you know, test the humidity of the sample that you're trying to evaluate. If it's sunny, but it's too humid, you don't play Frisbee. Otherwise, if it's sunny and it's not too humid, you heck yeah, we're playing some Frisbee. Anyway, that's how a decision tree works. And let me walk through these things on the left and just say it again, even though it was kind of in that example, is that a decision tree is a tree where there is an internal node. Um, the internal nodes of the tree contain tests on the features of your sample, of your X. Um, and that each node has one child per possible outcome of the test. So if the test is binary, 0, 1, does it contain a word or not? There'd be two children of that node. If the test is like, in the case of Outlook, they're in the, it's a categorical feature, so there's three possible outcomes. So then there'd be three children there, et cetera, et cetera. And then the leaves of the decision tree contain predictions. And so you start at the root, you walk a path from the root to a leaf by obeying the tests, you know, based on what your current properties are. And when you get to the leaf, there's going to be some answer there. Um, in this case, it's a yes or no. It could be uh, other things, regressions, whatever, whatever. We'll get to that. Right. So internal nodes contain tests. And we've talked about three types of features. We talked about binary zero one features, categorical features, which contain a set of values, numeric features, which contain a number. And just for completeness, I kind of said it on the last slide, but to say it again, a binary feature in a decision tree, when, when the decision tree tests a binary feature, xi happens to be binary, then the test node has two outputs, one for when the binary value is one or true, and the other for when the binary value is false or zero. All right, and so for categorical features, um, it can have any number of output values. Um, the outlook, you know, all different weather outlooks, it could have a categorical feature could be the make of a car. It could be, um, you know, everything that we've seen in other lectures. And a test of a feature where that feature is categorical will have one child for each possible outcome of that test. In the simplest case, I mean, there's always caveats and things you can do to get more and more complicated. Um, and one thing you'll see here is that when we were doing logistic regression, we didn't really need to worry about the types of our features because everything was pretty much a number or a binary or something along those lines. As you get into decision trees, you might have to start passing along a little bit of type information. Now, I've hidden that from you in the assignments, but it's just something to keep in mind that in order to interpret what you should do with a test, you need to know a little bit about the type of feature that you bump into. Then numeric features um, include the feature identity, you know, what I, you know, feature 72 is the feature we're going to test, but they also contain a threshold that, you know, true or false. So it, the simplest case is to turn it into a binary decision with a particular threshold greater than or equal to or less than or whichever way you want to do it. So these are the three things that we're going to have in our simple decision trees we'll be talking about in the first assignment, and maybe probably throughout everything we do. Now, the internal nodes are the tests, and the leaves contain the predictions. So if you're doing classification, a leaf will contain the answer. The answer, y equals 1. So you, you traverse down, you get to a place, you say y equals 1. It's right there in the leaf. You return it and go on. Regression, you can do a very similar thing where the answer is in the leaf. Uh, so you just, you know, you traverse the tree, you get to a particular leaf, and it says, well, in that case, the temperature is 101.2. Um, it is possible to have slightly more complicated models at the leaves. Just saying this to, like, forestall the question, we're not going to do that. But it's possible that you could have 
some other kind of regressor at the leaf. So each path through the tree gets you to a leaf and each leaf looks at other features and does some sort of a, a calculation to determine what to predict. But the simplest form of decision trees, which can work quite effectively, you go to a leaf, there's a number there, you say that number, that's your answer, that's your y hat. Probability estimation will contain the distribution at the leaf. So you could think of um, something like the uh, probability of y equals 0 is 30%, the probability of y equals 1 is 30%, the probability of y equals 2 is 40%, and then you would have some sort of threshold probably to turn that estim estimation into a classification, something along those lines. And you'll see when we get into learning trees that you pretty much um, generally have a probability estimation in that we will store at each leaf the distribution of training samples that reach that leaf while we're growing the tree and then we can just return the probability by looking at that distribution with a little bit of smoothing but all of that is getting ahead of me a little bit uh, we i will explain that all in more detail over the following slides don't worry if that went past you a little but anyway you can see that uh, just with these very, very simple modules or, you know, kind of conceptual things, you can plug into a decision tree structure and produce a wide range of outputs or model types or prediction types without conceptually changing very much. That's one of the nice things about a decision tree is it's flexible. Now let's talk through a little bit about what this produces. If this is our sample decision tree and here is just a here's some sketch place for us to draw what that decision tree is gonna do. Um, what is this decision tree gonna do? Now remember, uh, we talked about linear models, which could do that or that or that. What is a decision tree more powerful? Is a decision tree less powerful? What do these if statements work out to? Um, so in this first case, we'd say if x2 is less than three, so we can draw a line there. And so if it's less than, we'll go this way, and we'll say if x1 is less than four, so less than, less than, now we're talking about this region. And so that would be if it's less than, it goes this way and it would predict zero. And if it's greater than, it would go that way and it would predict one. Now we go down this other branch and then we would get to if x1 is less than three. So x1 is less than three would be something like that. Um, if it's not less than three, it's greater than, it would predict one, otherwise, it goes down this branch, and now we would say if x2 is less than 4, so we just carve off a little thing there. If it's less than 4, it would be 0, and if it's greater than 4, it would be 1. So that is the decision boundary of this particular decision tree. Um, we could clean it up a little bit, and it would be a little staircase like this. If we wanted to learn something similar with a lin linear model, the best we could do would be, I don't know, maybe I can't. That might not be the best we could do. Maybe we could do a little better than that, something along those lines. And so they don't quite line up the same. They're a little bit different. Maybe one's better for some things. Another might be better for other things. All right, here's an example of the decision tree put next to an example of a linear model. And the one point that I want to make here is that a decision, well, a linear model has a fixed number of parameters. That is, for each input dimension, it has a single weight which is what you use to interpret that weight. A decision tree can have many, many more parameters. It could have essentially infinite parameters, particularly if you're dealing with numbers. You could have tests for like, is it 4.1, is it 4.11, is it 4.12, is it 4.2, is it 4.7, is it 4.9? You could test and test and test, and you could carve the space up into an incredibly complex surface. Um, of course, you know every decision point that you have with this simple set of um, test types are gonna be access parallel cuts. So you're gonna take a particular dimension and cut the space um, in an access parallel way along that dimension. Um, perpendicular, parallel, something. I mean, you guys know what I'm saying. Uh, so you kind of have these, these blocky things and so you can cut the space up into any sort of like blocked structure and in each region of that space you could make a different classification. Uh, so in some sense, a decision tree can represent more complicated structures than logistic regression in any particular dimensional, you know, dimensionality. Um, another way to look at that is like if, if we wanted to have a decision tree approximate that linear cut in this space on the right, you would, you know, first maybe you would cut like there, then you would have a cut there, 
then you would have like a cut there, then you'd have 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 a cut maybe there, then you'd have a cut there, and you'd kind of like fill this space in with cuts and cuts and cuts until you've approximated to whatever resolution you're able to get to um, the region that you want to classify as zero. And there'll always be a little bit of jiggles there where you probably wouldn't perfectly categorize, I mean, you certainly wouldn't perfectly categorize it, but you could get arbitrarily close by adding an arbitrary amount of tests to your decision tree. So that's one of the strengths of decision trees. It's also really one of the weaknesses um, is that creating all of that structure tends to do what we call overfitting or learning a concept in a way more complicated than you really should. We're gonna have a whole lecture on overfitting, so I'm not gonna get into it much more here. But um, the thing to take away from all of this discussion on this slide is that you can add structure to the decision tree to create increasingly powerful representations of a concept. And that as you add more and more structure, it's somewhat equivalent to adding parameters to a logistic regression model or adding essentially other dimensions, like the number of dimensions and the number of nodes in a tree somehow not exactly the same because they're on different spaces, but that's a sense of how complicated is this model I've learned. Well, it's as complicated as the number of tests in your decision tree. So there you go. Quick summary, um, decision trees support many types of features, categorical, numeric, all binary, and many types of predictions in a straightforward way. And that's one of the nice things about it is that you can take it and use it on problems that have um, you know, any one of those things. And also it very easily works on problems that have mixed feature types. Some are numeric, some are categorical, some are binary. Very straightforward to do with decision trees. You just put the appropriate type of test node in the structure as you're growing the structure. Decision trees can represent many, many functions, maybe not everything, but many, many functions arbitrarily well, but it may require a lot of nodes in the tree, or a lot of complexity in the model, which means it may be hard to learn more complex concepts based on the amount of data that you have. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the loss function that we're gonna use when we're building decision trees in our assignments and for at least the rest of this discussion. And it's a simple version of it, but it can get you a long way. Um, we're gonna do decision trees for classification. And so the loss will be focused on this classification. And, and just like we did with logistic regression where we're doing classification, but we predict a probability and use a threshold, we're gonna do the same thing here. So at each leaf, we're gonna store a distribution and then have a threshold on the probability that that distribution has for us. And then the loss function is gonna somehow reason about the distributions across the different leaves of the tree to um, come up with a value that's gonna direct our optimization phase that we'll get to soon. Okay, so here we go. This is a simple way to think about the loss of a particular version of a tree structure. The way that you do it is you, um, take the tree, you take your training data and pass it through the tree to find the leaf that it ends up at. Then you store the class labels at the leaf of all the training examples that end up at the leaf. Then when you're done doing that, you estimate the loss on the leaf after all the training data has gotten everywhere that it's gonna go in the tree. Um, and then you basically sum average the loss across the training data set. So a particular leaf will have a loss based on the distribution that's there, and then that will contribute loss to the overall weighted sum by the percentage of samples that ended up at that leaf. Now let's walk through this in a little bit more concrete fashion, and hopefully you'll see what that means. I mean, there's a lot of dangling variables, things I haven't explained, like what does it mean to calculate the loss on a leaf? Don't worry, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. So. With this particular tree example here, we have X1 and we have Y. And we would say, um, if X1 equals one, we go to the right. So X1 equals one, we have Y equals one once, Y equals one, two, Y equals zero once, Y equals zero, two, Y equals zero, three. So we have three and two. Then on the other side, it's everything else. Y equals one once, one twice, one three times, zero, zero, so three and two. Um, I'm gonna click and those numbers are gonna come up right behind there, so I don't know why I did all of that writing, but I did. Uh, is my handwriting neater or is the, t yeah, okay, let's go with that. So that is 
Step one, you take the training data, you push it to the leaves, and you get the class label distribution or the Y distribution of the training data there. Okay, so if you want to look at this leaf after we've pushed all the training data down to it, you would say that this leaf would probably classify Y as one. So Y hat would be one because um, one was the most probable class label out of all the training data that reached it. So if you were going to make a prediction, that's what you'd pick. Maybe we'd use a threshold and do something else. But for now, let's just, let's just say that's true. Um, and if you did that, your error rate would be 40%. That's not great. Um, and in some sense, the loss of this leaf is somehow related to that 40%. We're going to see where there's more math to it than just that. But for now, it's somehow like 40%. Um, and then if you, you do the same thing on the other side, and you'd say the overall tree's error rate, if we were using accuracy or error rate as the loss function, would be 40% because each leaf has a 40% error rate. and Half of the training data was there, and half of the training data was there. So when you do the weighted sum of 50% times 40% error rate plus 50% of the data uh, with the 40% error rate that you're getting here, uh, that weighted sum says, hey, the overall tree's weighted error rate on the training data is 40%. That's not our loss. That's heading us towards our loss. I'm just showing you the thought process that's going to get us there. So now let's say we had another feature, x2. It would say, can we get better than this overall weighted error rate of 40% by adding some more tests? OK, so let's just say um, we'll leave this side the same. So the overall error rate is, again, going to be 40%. But let's add another split there. And I mean, I could work it through. Why don't you just think it through? And I'm going to press a button, and some numbers are going to come up here. But Jeopardy music time, boo doo doo. And, um, what numbers? Okay. And okay. Well, that's a lot better. That's a heck of a lot better. Um, in fact, every time x1 is true, we're able to essentially get the right answer in the sense that, um, you know, if you get to this leaf, you would, let's see what I click, right? You get to this leaf, and you would essentially predict that y equals 0. And all the training samples you have also say y equals 0. So your error rate on the training set is 0 for that leaf, uh, similarly for that leaf, except for y equals 1. And then if you're going to do the weighting, you're going to have that 40% error rate on half your data and a 0% error rate on the other half of your data. So the overall error rate of this tree is significantly better than the overall error rate of that slightly more simple version of the tree. And you would say that, you know, in some sense, the loss of this more complicated tree is going to be lower than the loss of the simple tree. We'll get there. And we would call this loss reduction um, information gain. And that's a commonly used phrase in decision trees. Uh, for various reasons, which I think you'll see as we go through entropy and what it means. But the point is that the more complicated tree has gained us information about the underlying concept. So just if I, if I slip and I start saying instead of loss reduction, information gain, just to know that those are essentially sort of um, synonyms that just kind of came out of different thought processes when algorithms were created. And one interesting property of this is that making a leaf more complicated by insert like we did here we made we made that leaf more and comp more complicated by turning it into a test and that added structure to the decision tree so the entire subtree here in some sense is us making this leaf more complex you might say it that way but by making this um, more complex we affect every sample that goes through that leaf and we do not affect any sample, the prediction for any sample that does not go through that leaf. Because if you go back to the root of the tree here at the top, every sample that's gone this way has already gone that way. No matter what you do over here, it's not going to affect any sample that got pushed down that line. So these, these are sort of independent. Once you've taken a branch in a decision, you are on that path and there's no going back. OK, so let's consider what would happen if we were going to use the training set error rate as our loss function. And so there the loss of um, 
Y hat and Y would be a weighted sum over all training samples of zero if the prediction of the tree is equal to the correct class label for the sample, otherwise one. So if they disagree, it's one, otherwise it's zero. And then this weighting here turns it into an overall error rate across the entire training set. So that is um, the shape of what our loss function is gonna end up being. All right, so well, let's see what this might um, cause. And if we had a tree with just a single node, that node would be a leaf because it's, you know, it's the root of the tree, it's a leaf. So you would just have a distribution here. And if you had 20 training samples with a label y equals zero and 10 training samples with a y equals one, this leaf's error rate would be 33%. And because of, you know, the overall tree's error rate would also be 33%. Now imagine we'd have a slightly more complicated tree. So let's say we test the value of x1. And we'd see here that um, x1 does something. It certainly changes the distribution of the class labels between its two possible outcomes. So there's some information there. Um, one of the leaves gets a little better. One of the leaves gets a little bit worse. But overall, because you're doing the weighted thing across the entire tree, the entire tree's error rate hasn't changed. Okay, so what's the problem with that? Well, there's really no gain. The overall tree error rate is 33% and the leaf er overall error rate is 33%. And you could in some sense say that, hey, these are the same darn things. I wouldn't prefer adding this split because it doesn't make the tree better, but it also adds complexity. Um, and so complexity for complexity's sake is not good. But that's not really what's going on because the distributions at the leaves have made progress. And we can see that this leaf is getting more pure. We're doing a lot better there. Um, and there's a chance that this leaf could get better if we added some more splits to it. Um, so this notion that the distributions are heading somewhere, um, particularly if they're heading generically in a good direction and the strength of the one that got better is like, outweighing the cost of that, uh, that we would say, no, you know, there actually is a loss reduction between these two trees. It's just that accuracy is too coarse a me measure for it. And it's similar in the um, previous, in when we we're doing logistic regression, where we wanted to use something like log loss that was continuous. So you can see those small improvements as you're heading towards making an accuracy gain. You can take those steps in between the accuracy gains because, um, the uh, the loss function lets you see the progress that you're making. You're like somehow you're still wrong, but you're a little less wrong. Now we're going to talk about um, how do we get from accuracy to the loss function that we're actually going to use for our decision tree induction algorithm. Sometimes decision tree learning is called decision tree induction, um, and that is entropy and entropy reduction. So entropy will be our loss. But what the heck is entropy? And to do that, to know what that is, we need to talk a tiny bit about information theory. Um, tiny bit, don't worry, it's not gonna be too bad. So in um, information theory, the entropy is the number of bits of information needed to complete a partial message. So if I send you a message and that message is incomplete, but then I send you a, like out of band, a little bit additional information, how much do I need to send through that second packet so that you can complete the message that's contained in the first packet? <laughs> okay, so what does that mean? Now, let's say we have a message, which is a training sample or a bunch of feature values, and I wanna send that message to you, but I can't send it to you directly. I have to use this imperfect translator, which is the decision tree model that we've produced so far. So let's say I take that message and I pass it through to the decision tree. And instead of sending you the Y associated with the message, I send you the Y hat that comes out of the decision tree. Now that's what you get, but to interpret it on average across every possible message that I could send you using that decision tree, you're gonna need some extra information because some of the Y hats might be correct, some of them might be wrong, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll need to send you for each individual one, I'll need to send you a little bit of extra information on average so you can interpret it and get back to the original Y. 
Now let's go through a particular sample where if we just have one feature and here is our model that we're using to um, translate the message and then I'm gonna send you that Y hat that comes out of this model um, and let's say this is the training data. You would see that once you know the value of X1, you pretty much know the value of Y because among the training set, um, the two leaves here are totally pure. So in this case, if I was gonna send you a message, I could use this tree and I wouldn't need to send you any extra message or any extra information at all because the Y hat itself contains a perfect representation of the training data that I'm trying to communicate to you through this model. Right? Now let's look at another case. Here's a case where um, if you test the value of X1, you have a completely uniform distribution at both of the leaves. And what that means is that um, if you get to this leaf here, Y is 50% likely to be zero among the training data and 50% likely to be one. Similarly, if you go here and the value of X1 is true, X1 equals one, then, you know, same thing, 50-50. So in order to properly communicate you what the value of Y is, if I have to pass the message through this tree, I just need to send you Y because that tree is not helping at all. It's completely, every leaf is completely confused at the maximum level of confusion. So you would say that the tree at the top has zero entropy. It's a zero entropy communication channel because you can pass your information right through it and you're not losing anything. You're not gaining any entropy. And so there you go. Whereas you could say that the tree on the bottom is a maximal entropy communication channel because when you go through that communication channel, you lose everything you knew about the message that you're trying to send. And you essentially need to send the message itself in this out-of-band packet in order for the receiver to know what the heck you were trying to say. So entropy, this concept of entropy, of how much information about the training data you're losing by passing it through the tree, is what we're gonna use as our loss function for learning the structure of decision trees. Now let's go through that in a little more detail. And we could say that the um, entropy of a distribution, so each leaf contains a distribution, you would say it's negative. It's important to see that there's a negative sign there. Um, and you would sum over all possible values for y, and you would say the proportion of samples at that leaf that have the particular value of y times the log base 2 of the proportion of samples at the leaf that have that particular y. So one thing I like to say is you just sum over the values of y and you do p log p. The probability it has that value times the log of the probability it has that value. Log base 2, if we're going to talk about bits of information, so let's just stick with the 2. And um, just to help, I brought this up here so you can remember what the log of a, of a number between 0 and 1 looks like. Um, this is a type, you know, like people who think in math don't need this chart, right? I need the chart. I put it on the slides. If you don't need the chart, please don't, don't think less of me. All right, let's do a sample here. And if we take this first row, uh, that's the distribution we're trying to calculate the entropy for. And this looks kind of familiar to the last slide, except... Now we're gonna show you the ways to be, to precisely calculate it, um, do a little bit of cleanup there. And we would say um, P of Y equals zero times log two of P of Y equals zero. And P of Y equals zero, there's 10 samples and half of them have Y equals zero. So that's 0.5. And the log of 0.5, we go down there and we would say, oh, that's negative one times negative one plus uh, 0.5 times again negative 1 um, and then I'll click and that'll come up in neater handwriting and you see where all of those things came from then you just sum all that up and that equals to 1 uh, remember you have to bring this negative down here so it, it's negative 1 so the entropy of that first row there would be 1 now go and look at that second one and calculate it through um, put the numbers here, I'll, I'll draw a box, put them right there as you think it through. I mean, come on, whatever, but um, uh, 
right? It turns out to zero because for reasons. Okay, so let's move on from that and say that when you have a binary Y, if you're doing classification or you know binary zero one predictions, uh, you can plot the entropy with respect to the probability of y equals zero or y equals one because it'll be you know it'll be one minus so uh, this thing will be symmetrical around 0.5 um, and that's just the shape of the plot for entropy across the different values of the distribution of class labels that you might bump into. Okay, now we've built up. We went from how to calculate the error-based loss to what entropy even means, why accuracy wouldn't work, what then technically, how do you calculate entropy? And now this is the loss function we're going to use right here is written there in the upper right-hand corner. Let's walk through it. Now this um, formula in the upper right, the loss on a set of samples, that is the S right there, is we iterate across the samples and we calculate the entropy of the leaf that that sample arrives at. So then we sum across all possible samples and we average it. So the loss for a set is the average loss for the samples of that set and that loss is calculated by which leaf of the tree they arrive at and it's weighted by the number of samples that arrive at the particular leaf. Calculate through this a little bit. So if there's a single node tree, that's just one leaf. Every sample is going to arrive at that same leaf. There are 100 samples here. The entropy of that leaf, it's 50-50, so we would find that that spot, so the entropy is one. So, you know, each one, so it's 100 divided by the 100 in the sample, and the entropy the loss of this particular tree here with that particular training set is one. Entropy is one, loss is one, there you go. Now, if we were gonna go on to a slightly more complicated tree here, we would see that the PY equals zero is 25. Um, 25, so we come up and be like, okay, that's about 0.8. And again, it's 75, and we can see that they're symmetrical, 0.8 and we would do the weighted sum across all of those and we would get an entropy of about 0.8. Now, if we split on a different feature and we saw something like this, 90-10. So as we're going from being a completely uniform distribution to being a more pure or kind of spiked distribution uh, where a particular value is more common than the other one, our entropy starts to go down very quickly. We start heading down this, this thing and we'll see that the entropy here is 45, and then there is 45, so these two leaves, um, and 47, 47, I'm sorry, I don't have calculators for eyes. Now, if you compare these three things and say, hey, these are three alternatives, you might even say that this is the initial tree that you have that has no structure in it, and we'll see in the optimization that the way you build a tree is by adding some structure. So you'd say, well, here's two candidate structure pieces to add. Um, do either of these additions have an information gain over the original tree? And if so, which one has the larger gain? And that would be how you would pick which is better. So from the initial top one, the loss of that training set with that tree is one. So going to the next one, you'd have an information gain of 0.2. And going to the final one, you'd have an additional information gain, 0.33, something along those lines. Um, there you go. Just a little walkthrough of the loss for a decision tree and how to think about it and uh, starts for the learner decision tree algorithm. Okay, and here is the decision tree optimization. Very simple in its simple case. Uh, it's a greedy search with a single step of look ahead. There you go. That's all you need to know. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll tell you a little more. We'll go through this a little more. So the outline of the algorithm is that you start with a single leaf. Your initial tree is just a leaf. All the training samples go to that leaf and um, the distribution at the leaf is the same as the overall distribution of the class labels in your training data. Now the next thing that you're gonna do is that you calculate the information gain of adding every possible split that you have available to you 
to the tree. So convert that initial leaf into an internal node that tests each of the features according to every possible value that it could test it at. Um, for the case of a binary feature, it's just like 0, 1. For categorical, remember, it's a breakout. For a numeric feature, it's a little bit more complicated. We're going to go through that more in detail. There'll be a couple slides about that in a few slides. But among all of those splits where you've calculated their information gain, you pick the one that has the largest information gain, and then you convert your leaf, your single leaf tree, single node tree, into a tree that has a split on the best feature as the root, and the data is split according to the values of those features. So, of course, the next thing you do is you would take your training data and divide it according to the value of the split feature, push it to the leaves appropriately, the same, you know, depending on the value of that feature on the training data, and then you would recursively call the tree building function on each of those leaves that you've just produced until you hit a stopping criteria. Now, there's a lot of possible stopping criteria. I think we're going to spend some time on that in a little bit. Um, conceptually, pretty darn simple algorithm, full training set, greedy search to find what's the best way to divide the training set in order to most reduce entropy or have the largest information gain. You have to keep splitting your data into smaller and smaller sets. So as the data gets pushed down towards the leaves, you have less and less data available to make decisions. Um, as we saw in the statistics, uh, you know, the bounds thing, having less data has a whole bunch of problems. So as you get closer and closer to the leaves, you maybe have less and less certain decisions about what the right split is. And you go as far as you can bear to go, given your knowledge of statistics and how little information you have to make the decisions that you're making. Let's show that in um, code to some degree. We'd have this function grow tree, which takes your training set um, then these first two elements here are essentially the termination condition. So the termination conditions, uh, one termination condition is that you've split your data until among the, tr the set of training samples that reach a leaf, they all have the same class label. At that point, there is no further split that's going to increase your info or that's going to give you information gain or reduce your entropy. So once you get to that point, you just stop, create a new leaf, predicting the most common class at the leaf, whichever the only class label is at the leaf. Um, otherwise, if it's the other class label, there you go. That's essentially the termination condition, although we'll see there's other termination conditions that you're going to want to do. The next thing you do is, if it's not termination, you choose the best attribute. And here is the pseudocode of finding the best attribute to split on. You have a list of information gains. You iterate over the features. You calculate the information gain for each feature among the samples that are at that leaf that, you know, basically this is a recursive algorithm. So whichever samples have made it to that point, you use those. Then if all information gains equal zero, that is no further split will add information. That is also this case, but there it could happen for other reasons as well. But if there's no information gain, you terminate. Otherwise, you return the feature index with the highest information gain. Remember, um, information gain is the entropy of the set before doing the split minus the entropy, the weighted entropy of doing the split. And then the split entropy is basically you simulate doing the split on that particular feature value. And you simulate creating the tree that that would create by doing this stuff. Then you calculate the entropy and you know do the weighted sum and return the average entropy of the samples in the set after doing the split. So essentially, it's like after doing that potential split, before doing that potential split, and you find the one that increases that the most. And as you probably can see, um, there's a lot of calculations here that in this simple pseudocode form are highly duplicated. You're probably not going to want to leave some of these obviously hyper duplicative things in your implementation. I don't want to say you should go do a lot of optimization, but if you're silly in the way you do this, you're going to end up sad. I mean, waiting around for a long time to run the assignments. 
then this next step here essentially says you have picked your split attribute and now you partition the data into two subsets and then you just make your recursive call. You would say at this node, here's the feature that I split on. Um, you may have a threshold if you're doing numerics, we're gonna get to how you would learn the threshold for a numeric feature. Then you make those recursive calls. And that is simple decision tree optimization. Now stopping criteria. Uh, you could grow the tree until every leaf only contains training samples that have a single class label. Um, just by splitting more and more and more. Not in every case. You may not have enough features to get there, or there may be noise where two training samples that have exactly the same feature values have different labels. So these are a couple things that can mess up your thought process when trying to figure out, should I stop growing the tree or where do I, where do, I do some tests for decision trees and stuff. But So you could grow a tree that gets as perfect as you can get. And that's what this says here. There are three ways to think about it. One is that you run out of features to test. Um, if a feature is binary, you really only need to split on it once in a path, any path from a leaf to the root. So if you are in a particular type of training set feature space, you will run out of things to do and then you'll have to stop. Another thing is you could do like this um, convergence, say like, look, I'm not going to take a step unless I gain at least 0.1 information gain, something along those lines. That's another way you can control this process. Another thing you can do is, like I said, grow until everything is pure. I mean, you can't ever grow past this. So once something is pure, you sort of have to stop. But that is kind of a mechanical way to think about it. But what you really want to do is you want to grow a tree until there isn't enough data to make good decisions. Because otherwise, you're going to, just like we talked about in that generalization lecture, you are going to pick splits that happen to look good on the data you have available, but that do not generalize well to data that you haven't seen yet. Now, there's a lot of heuristics for doing this. Um, one is to control the minimum number of samples needed to take a step. This is sort of indifferent to how hard the decision is, because if, um, you know, let's say you have five samples left, you're gonna have very large error bars on your information gain. And we're not actually calculating them in this process, but conceptually, if you're making a decision with five samples, calculating the information gain, you're gonna have very large error bars, but that's okay. Sometimes decisions are easy and sometimes splitting even with five samples is clearly better than not splitting. Um, but it's very common in decision trees to just pick a number and say, hey, look, when there's less than 10 samples, I'm done. Just stop there. That's all, that's all we're going to do. Um, another way to look at this is you might say that simpler concepts are, I would prefer a simpler concept to a more complicated concept, kind of irrespective of anything else. And you could put constraints on your decision tree. You could say, this, I'm going to have a maximum of N nodes in the decision tree. So you, you may, instead of doing a fully recursive thing, you may uh, kind of expand the leaf that has the largest information gain. Um, so you might, you might change the core algorithm from being fully recursive, like depth first, blah, 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 to being a breadth first, where at each step you expand the leaf that has the most information gain. Common thing to do is to say, you know, don't grow me any tree that has depth greater than 10, 20, whatever it is. And then another common thing to do is to say that, um, every node I add to my tree actually increase, you know, has a penalty. So balance the structure with the information gain according to some, to, to some sensibility about how damaging having structure is. And this is a Bayesian thought process. You remember we talked about that kind of like map thing uh, where you'd have a prior. You could think about like, hey, I have a prior that my decision tree should have 50 nodes. And as you get further and further away from a decision tree with 50 nodes, you would say that it's less and less likely that that is the tree I'm trying to learn. So there's sort of a Bayesian interpretation in this kind of complexity controlling part of learning a decision tree. And then of course, hybrid, everything, nothing pure ever really happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that decision trees on their own tend to overfit because they do have a great deal of power in that they can continue to add more and more structure and do a better and better job of reducing training set loss. But it often comes that 
to the point that you're not making good decisions anymore. And so you're starting to get into troubles of overfitting. Right now, that's the um, three parts of the decision tree induction algorithm, a basic decision tree learning algorithm. We had the structure and the types of tests we could have and the types of leaves we could have. We had the loss of entropy. Of course, there's other options, but that's what we've talked about in this course and we're gonna use in our assignments. And we had the very simple recursive algorithm to learn the decision tree structure. Um, a quick, gonna go back over what those tests are for the internal nodes and what you might do about it. A uh, few little options. For categorical features, when we first talked about it, we said you could have one child per possible value for each possible value of the feature. Another thing you could do is you could have one versus the rest. So instead of considering a single split that just goes zhook to all the possibilities, you could instead say, well, what would happen if I split off the value of sunny day compared to rainy, windy, whatever the other possibilities are? Or what would happen if I split off Lexus compared to all the other car brands? And so it's a pretty simple conceptual change to the search process to add that type of node. And it can also often be really valuable because it allows you to pluck out important values of a feature without hyper diluting the data available to make later decisions for the other things because you don't have to like, like if you have 100 values of a categorical feature, you don't go book and then your data is diluted by a factor of 100. No, you can still do just a single binary split. Then you could, you know, let's say, la di da right? Like you could, instead of splitting off one, you could search for, hey, let's split off these three. Um, and you could essentially put more and more search at training time in how you're going to deal with a categorical feature in the context of any particular decision you're trying to make versus if you have a lot of data, you might just do this thing and be like brute force, let's go. And it's it just up to you. Like, do you want to trade off data versus time versus whatever? For numerical features, things get a little bit more complicated. Now we're gonna spend a few slides going through some options here and um, you're gonna, for the assignment, you're gonna to have to implement numerical features in a slightly sophisticated way. And we need this to allow us to eventually get to doing boosted trees um, in the context of, of the assignment. So, so this, is, um, this is a place where we're gonna invest a little bit more into a detail than generically I might say we, I would. Um, but so with a numerical feature, one possibility is that you have a training set. You could split at any possible value of the feature and you could just try them all. Probably is going to be too slow. We'll get into that. Um, but there's a, there's a couple simple kind of like, kind of like sloppy things you could do to get you a functioning numerical feature decision tree without having to go do a bunch of the work that we're going to have to go do. <laughs> One of them is that you could just split the range of the feature evenly. Like if the, the feature ranges, you just look at the training data. If it ranges from zero to one, you just say, well, I'm going to consider a split at 0.5. Is that good? I don't know, maybe. Um, and then later on in the search process, you might, you know, if you do take that split, then eventually you'd consider a split of that variable at 0.75. So you may have to do multiple splits to get in to find what the right threshold would have been. So the other thing you could do is instead of just split the observable range into two values, you could create buckets. So you could have, you could turn it into essentially a categorical feature, or you could split the samples evenly. Like what's the threshold that puts 50 samples down one side and 50 samples down the other side, fine. These are all things you could do if you're implementing this and you need to move quickly. But let's go through a little bit more detail. So if this is our training data, we have the X's and the Y's, we could try a split at each possible value of the X. We could say like, look, is it greater than 80? Is it greater than 44? We could try, you know, whatever we wanna do. So let's say we try if X1 is greater than 1.95, plucked a number out at random. Um, we could walk through this, count them up, and we're gonna see that that is the property of taking that split. This side looks pretty pure. This side, not so great. Um, if we calculate the entropy, we'd see that the weighted entropy, or you know, the loss in this case is 0.8 about. Now we could pick another threshold. La di da, here we go. Right in those numbers. Um, in this case, ooh, this looks a lot better. So that higher that higher value is getting us somewhere. Um, that's not so bad and that's really good. 
The overall entropy here is 39, but there's a lot of other things we could try. I don't know, is that good? Um, this is gonna take forever, quite honestly, you know, to calculate all of this and to update all of these distributions for every, you know, like iterating through here. Whoa, this is not gonna work. Okay, let's look at something else. Another thing we could do is we could try a split midway between each value of xi, in this case, x1. So the first thing that you'd have to do then is you'd have to sort by the value of x1. And this is the big pain in the butt because in order to really deal with numeric features well, you have to sort and resort and resort and resort and resort your data all the time. Sort, 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 sort. A lot of complexity in decision tree induction algorithms come with, well, how do I sort efficiently? How do I maintain partial sorts? How do I scale when the data doesn't all fit in RAM? Which was more important maybe when I was doing this, but may still even be important now. Anyway, you've sorted by the value of x1. Then you can now consider what we were trying to do of uh, split at each possible value by doing a single pass across this and incrementing the statistics as you go. And we're going to see how to do that. But uh, um, so you might start by saying, well, what if I split at something below 0.2? So let's say I split at zero, right? So you could, you could say, well, what happens if we're going to split there? And the distribution of samples below this is zero, zero, and above it is five, five. Now we want to evaluate every possible split point. And in fact, um, in general, you would just pick a value halfway between the value of each successive one in the sort order. Um, just like, you know, it's why not? So moving on from considering that to considering this, now we can update incrementally these distributions just for the one sample that has moved below the threshold because of, of that update. So that guy has a y value equals to one. So we just do a simple thing here. We say one and four. Um, then you can calculate the entropy and, you know, by extension, the information gain of these two splits pretty quickly. I mean, the main cost so far was the sort. And you could go one step further. Again, another one has come there. So you'd put a two there and a three there. And in that sense, single pass of the data plus the sort, you've calculated all the um, possible thresholds for that and at the end of it you're going to have the optimal thing to do but there's one more little trick that you might want to consider um, the optimal will occur between values of x1 where the y changes say it again the optimal will occur between values of x1 where y changes and the reason for that is right here at this particular split point the entropy is about 0.8 but if you were to move the threshold lower and in essence, make it so some of these samples where the value of y equals one move above the threshold, what you're doing is you're moving them from this distribution where things are kind of pure and you're taking away something that is getting a really good entropy at its leaf and you're pushing it here. And not only are you pushing it into a leaf that has a higher entropy to begin with, but you're actually making that entropy worse with every, every time you move the threshold in this direction and add more ones. Conversely, if you move the threshold in the other direction, um, every y equals one that you push up into that distribution is awesome. For two reasons. Number one, you're taking that sample, moving it into this distribution where the entropy is zero, so that's really helping your score. But simultaneously, you're making the distribution at that leaf better. So as long as you're, if moving one sample where y equals one from this direction to that direction makes things better, moving a stream of a thousand of them, there it's all gonna make it better. There's no point where doing more of that is gonna start looking bad. Um, then when you hit this point, um, conceptually as you're as you're traversing in this direction, you won't know that like these things are all zero and there may be pockets of one, zero, 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 one. So you need to you need to keep searching and find all of those different breakpoints before you've figured out that you really have the optimal. But you know, for any for any next sequence of y values, either it's gonna make it better or it's gonna make it worse. And so you can just skip ahead and evaluate it at at you know that point.
Anyway, those are a few tricks that you're going to need to do in order to get your numeric features working reasonably fast so that we can get into a boosting algorithm that uses them. And now a summary for how to deal with numeric features. And remember, you can have a mix of numeric and categorical and binary features. They can all be jumbled together. But as you're iterating over your features and trying out different tests to see which is the best, when you hit a numeric feature, what you do is you sort all of your data by the value of that feature that you've just hit that's a numeric feature. So you have to do a complete sort to keep everything together. Because if you split, you're going to need, you're going to need things sorted. Um, then you do a pass over the data in the sorted order, incrementally maintain the label distribution above and below the threshold, um, consider a threshold midway between each successive value of x, i, but if moving the threshold only moves a single type of y value between the distributions, you can skip calculating the entropy because that's not going to be your winner. So this, this is just to say that you know, in a pure world where there's no noise, each x you know, will have a single y value, but a lot of times there'll be um, an x that has, you know, 15 y equals 1 and 72 y equals 0 for the exact same value of that feature. So you need to just be aware of the fact that, you know, you may have to deal with that case. Um, otherwise, if, if you don't have that purity in the samples that move across the threshold, calculate the entropy because that may be the best split point for growing your tree. Now, that was a little bit more detail on how to deal with the tests, the numeric features, the categoricals, some options, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to go through a much simpler version of what to do with the predictions at the leaves. Um, if you're doing binary classification, you will return the most common label among the training samples that reach the leaf. Whether it's 0 or 1, you can return it. If you're doing a categorical classification, you will turn the most common label among the training samples that reach the leaf. Whatever it is, you return it. Probability estimations, um, and this is in general what we're going to be doing, is that you're going to have the smoothed probability distribution. Remember this additive smoothing stuff we've talked about. Um, you can always always use that trick to make probability estimates a little bit smoother. and Generally, we'll be doing this plus a threshold to get to our classifications. We don't need to be a uh, slave to this most common thing. We're able to, we're able to use that threshold. Um, and then for regression, you would return the most common value at the leaf, or like I think I mentioned before, you might do a little linear regression among the samples at the leaves to get the value of y, something along those lines, based on a few of the variables. Now. I said that one benefit of decision trees is that you can interpret them to some degree, and I think some degree is the operative word. But um, some things to think about is that if a feature is used at or near the root, that's the feature that has the most information gain in your training data. So it's very often worthwhile to grow a decision tree and look at the first three levels of the tree and kind of think about, well, if that was a rule set, if I had handcrafted that set of rules, um, what would I understand about my data from knowing the particular thresholds that got chosen, from knowing which features get picked, et cetera, et cetera. An another similar thing is that variables that get used a lot are somehow interesting. You know, if there's a particular numeric feature that gets split a whole bunch of times, or if there's a particular categorical feature that gets split not near the root, but like everywhere, kind of towards the leaves, it gets used many, 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 many times. That's interesting. You can learn something about that feature, or you could learn, maybe I should go and really explore that feature and see what the heck's going on, and maybe I could tweak the feature engineering I did there to make it a little bit clearer. Um, the other thing that you could do is you could sum up, you could, as you're growing the tree, you could sum up what is the aggregate information gain that the entire tree got because of using splits on a particular variable. So that would be a nice thing to add to, if you're going to do a slightly more complicated tree training process than we're going to do, that would be a nice feature to add, just so you can have that information. Um, another thing to do, in addition to just looking at you know, features according to these like really prominent aggregations, is you can look at prominent paths. Look at the single path from root to leaf, where the leaf has the most samples, something along those lines. and that creates a, essentially a rule. It'll be like, if blah and blah and blah and blah and blah and blah and blah, then y equals 1, something along those lines. Um, sometimes extracting highly accurate, very commonly used, whatever rules, um, and exploring them 
can give you a lot of insight about how your feature engineering has been going or what your model is going to do in practice. Another thing to do is to take important false positives. We're going to talk more about how cost of mistakes are not uniform. Some mistakes are a lot more important than others. Um, and you could look at the prominent path that is causing your most harmful false positives and be like, ooh, I must have some feature on there that is not interacting well with that type of user. Let me see if I can fix that. So those are some things that you might do when you learn a decision tree that you might not do with other model types just because a decision tree is more kind of intrinsically interpretable as a simple set of rules or, you know, I mean, it can be a lot of rules, but each rule is somewhat simple. You can get some mileage from that. And to give just a quick summary of this lecture, a decision tree is a algorithm that can recursively grow a tree that repeatedly partitions data by the best feature according to information gain or that you know reduces the overall entropy of the training data. It's flexible and simple in that you can do categorization, um, regression, probability prediction on all different types of features. Uh, using really just conceptually almost very similar things, maybe with a little bit of extra optimization needed to deal with numeric features just because of, you know, the complexity blows up a little bit. The hyperparameters of the decision tree algorithm are, you know, how you're going to do the partitioning. Is it going to be, whole, you know, one versus all, or are you going to do the fancy numeric stuff? But more importantly, how to control complexity. And we went through a lot of options of what that would be. And those, those were things like split until the leaf contains some small number of samples. Like once you get to less than five samples at a leaf stop, control the total number of leaves in the entire tree, control the total depth of the tree. Some hybrid between these require a particular minimum information gain to add a, to add a split to the tree. And um, when you're tuning decision trees in general, you play with hyperparameters more, I think, than we did when we were doing logistic regression. Maybe... Maybe that's not exactly true, but I, I do feel that decision trees bump into more problems. And we're going to implement a version of ensembles on top of the decision tree algorithm that we're going to build in the assignment. So don't mess it up. All right. Thanks. See you next time.